Good evening and welcome to Special Assignment. I'm your host, Ashraf Garda. Tonight we bring you a follow-up program on the Mozambican land debacle involving developer Bram Bruver and Pam Golding. After our last program, a number of investors came forward with documented proof on how Pam Golding had sold them land which is illegal under Mozambican law. Our investigation also found that Pam Golding, the developer, and attorney Nick De Beer held themselves to investors' monies held in a South African trust account that was never declared in Mozambique. Pam Golding declined to appear on our program to give their side of the story despite repeated requests for them to do so. This investigation by Frank Farrell. April 2004, a helicopter flies over the Uemji Lagoon in Bilan on board of Pam Golding estate agents. As the chopper comes into land, the excitement is palpable. Beautiful. Jet Ranger, my best. <laughs> this is Bram Bruer, an aspiring property developer with big dreams. Nobody's scared for a helicopter here. Yeah? You can drive, you're not problem. As the helicopter disappears behind Bram's thatched shelter, he's ready to welcome his guests. In grand style, the pilot makes a spectacular landing between the Pam Golding flags, stamping their approval on this project. This extravagant stunt sealed the dubious partnership with Pam Golding, officially opening the doomed La Perla complex. In 2001, David Strong and his business partner, Pat Kloch, owned a petrol station here at the busy intersection of Barry Herzog and Tana Road. Bram Brewer was a regular client. Bram was actually running a, uh, a garden services company and really was struggling. He, uh, um, he drove old buckies, which he used for his garden services, but yeah, he by no means was a wealthy man. He was a, a hard-working man that had to work very hard for every cent that he earned uh, doing garden services. But Brahms' financial woes were about to change. He had just acquired a two-hectare land concession to build a tourism resort in Bilan. His Mozambican partner was Balmiru Malat, the current ambassador to Japan. Mr. Malati applied for all the building licenses. I had nothing to do with that. The, the, the papers is in Portuguese, and I had a check by my lawyers. And, and Pam Golding had a check by their lawyers. The company was registered as a Perla Limitada. One of the company objectives was tourism and hotel restoration. The partners had a share capital of 20 million metikaj, which at the time was about 7,500 US dollars. But this was hard enough money to get the project off the ground. Potential investors like David Strong were also concerned on the legalities of the development. I'd known Brahm for a few years, being on the driveway and getting to know him. And, and Brahm talks big. And I was very concerned there wasn't a proper research done into it. And I was concerned that you know, my money would be, wouldn't be safe. And then I think two years or so into it, uh, he'd uh, tied up Pam Golding and the moment he did that it made me feel a lot safer and, and uh, at least put me at ease that, that a company like Pam Golding uh, would have done their due diligence and would have done their research and looked into it and made sure that at least you know if we put money into it that our money is safe. It was this pamphlet that caught David's eye. The prospect of owning a piece of paradise for a mere 150,000 rand had many investors interested. However, there was a catch. In small printed states, transfer of ownership to homeowners can only occur once a residence has been built. But to build a home, you first have to buy the land, which is illegal under Mozambican law. We took the pamphlet to Gudinho Owls at the Investment Promotion Center in Maputo for his comment. As you see here, so they are selling only the, all the, all the empty stands, not the, 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 the mm -hmm. but they should sell the developments on the ground, on that, on, on that property. The law puts it very clear. The transfer, the transfer of land is on the basis of what has been developed on that ground, not land. That's the transfer of the concession. However, with a high-profile company like Pam Golding marketing the project, 
Many investors felt safe buying into the deal. And it was only a matter of days when David's business partner, Pat Kloch, signed the offer to purchase. Essentially, once we had decided that we were going to go ahead with the purchase, I accompanied Bram Brevé um, to Pam Golding's offices in Hyde Park. I went there, met with uh, all the parties, and, and, and we signed the documentation, yeah, yeah and, and paid over, over the money. This is the document signed at the Pam Golding offices, a sub-concession for 603 square metres of land. He paid 325,000 rand for the undeveloped piece of land, plus the transfer fees. The money was paid into the Beer Attorney's Trust account. Coutinho Alves says this contract is fraudulent and is a violation of the Mozambican law. Legitimate. No, no, it's not legitimate for Mozambique. But this uh, trust account was not done in Mozambique. It was done in South Africa, but not in Mozambique. But remember, no, the, trans the transaction should not be on the land, but on the development. So it's that. not about the land, the development is about land. Investors' monies were paid from Nick De Beer Attorney's trust account to Pam Golding and Brown Brewer. The attorney also received the cut. Pam Golding acknowledged receiving about half a million rand in commission fees. This letter from Nedbank shows how Brown was paid more than 300,000 rand per month. In just 10 months, it collected more than 3 million rand. The law requires that banks investigate sudden increase in money deposits. Nedbank declined to comment. Forensic analyst Robert Cameron Ellis says banks have a responsibility to report suspicious transactions to monitor potential crimes. There are many in individuals um, who've been accused of fraud and corruption who are now also being prosecuted for money laundering. But taking the banks on hasn't yet happened. Um, and we're waiting for the Financial Intelligence Center to actually take the banks on for not reporting a suspicious transaction. Brown became a property tycoon overnight. With the money, he bought an airplane for 2.3 million rand. He splashed out more money on a fancy car, motorbikes, boats and horses. This amateur video footage shows potential investors disembarking from his plane in Bilan. He was living the good life. Would you say your life improved to you going into Mozambique? Um, for a short while, yes, for a short while. You made a lot of money. I didn't make it. I've got nothing today. I have a 1992 Ford that I bought from Mrs. Van Wyk. That is scrap. What car were you, were you driving when you arrived in Mozambique? When I arrived in Mozambique, I had a uh, Toyota Bucky. That's what I had. And uh, after that, you bought a Range Rover? Yes, from the bank. <laughs> you can buy a Range Rover from the bank. But it must be about a million rand for a Range Rover. No, I think they were about 600,000. It depends if it was new or second hand. Is yeah. that a crime? No, you were making a lot of money, Mr. Brewer. An aer aeroplane? Uh, yes, I bought the aeroplane for a while, uh, cheap, and, and fixed it, like I do with most, most things. Is that a crime? But, but your life certainly improved. Well, I don't know. <laughs> I've always had a good life. Coming up next, we confront Bram Brewer on his business dealings with Pam Golding. Since our last broadcast, we've been inundated with calls from people who are alleged to have been scammed by Bram Brewer and Pam Golding. Bram Brewer also approached us to give his side of the story. But since then, he's been ducking and diving. Today, suddenly out of the blue, he's agreed to speak to us. Let's go see if we can set up an appointment with him. We drive through the leafy suburb of Greenside, Johannesburg, to Brahms' house. A few meters from his home, I stop the car to make a phone call. Hi, Mr. Brewer. Hello? Hi, Mr. Brewer, can you hear me? Yeah, I'm Josh. It's, it's Frank here from a Special Assignment, man. Yeah. Can we, can we, can we come in? Are you at your house? No, no, I'm at the 
We later returned to the house for an arranged appointment. At this stage, I'm still not sure if he'll agree to an on-camera interview. So, we keep our camera rolling to get his reaction on tape. Come in. Hi, Mr. Brewer, how are you doing? Uh, what in the camera? You well? Yeah, uh, I'm well. And you? Good to meet you, man. Good to meet you. Excellent. Good, good, man. Good time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In the huh? This is the second time I'm meeting with Brahm. The first time we met, he urged me to do a follow-up story. He also gave me access to his computer. With this information, we could further our investigation. Um, well, let's sit here first and then you can tell me what you want. Why did you bring Pam Golding on board? Okay, let me say to you that I said to my management, I will not go to Mozambique without Pam Golding. Pam Golding is to me, and I still think very highly of them, um, uh, the doyen of eth ethics and are the best and probably the biggest estate agent company in the world. Who am I and how was I going to convince people from South Africa to take a risk to go and invest in Mozambique? Brahm says he entered into an agreement with Pam Golding to market and sell the La Perla complex. He says the real estate company insisted on receiving 20% commission for each sale. The agreement was between Pam Golding and La Perla. Uh, a contract was drawn up and the contract stated that Pam Golding will do all the pamphlets, all the advertising, uh, negotiate all the contracts uh, in their offices in Craigwall. Um, and uh, they would do all that and, I, and they want a 20% commission, which is a lot higher than normal. But I was quite prepared to do that uh, in the beginning um, because uh, of their name, their good name. The parties met regularly at the Pam Golding offices in the northern suburbs for fortnightly progress reports. Pam Golding. They insisted that we put all money in, in, in trust accounts. They insisted on having a meeting with the trust account attorney, which was my attorney, and, and, and uh, to update each other uh, on, on, on progress, because the first year we never sold a thing. Eventually, a number of investors started to buy undeveloped land from Pam Golding. Among them is this group of wealthy businessmen. They approached specialist Simon soon after our last program. Steve Boyk says the real estate mogul owes them an explanation. Uh, I'd like Pam Golding to tell us how they got involved and how they could have thought at any stage that this development was legitimate. Uh, knowing full well in hindsight now that they didn't have the duets, they didn't have the necessary paperwork you know, in place. The authorities have indicated that the development was, was an illegal development. Um, Pam Golding, I believe, have a lot to answer for. Despite numerous requests, Pam Golding has declined to be interviewed on camera. In an email, the company confirmed it was responsible for about 12 sales. It says it only facilitated the leasehold, and as far as they are concerned, they have complied with the law. Pat Clark says when Pam Golding realized there were problems, they never heard from them again. Pam Golding, when they realized there was an issue, and, and they opted out of um, the marketing of La Perla, um, at no stage did they go back to any of uh, the buyers and say there's a problem. Um, you know, before you go ahead and build your house or enter into a contract with the builder, just uh, hang ten. You know, that didn't happen. At this stage, Pam Golding also terminated the association with La Perla. However, Brown Brewer continued to expand his property empire, taking more investors' money. This is Blue Diamond, a stone's throw away from the La Perla complex. Mozambican businesswoman Yolanda Fernandes says Brahm came to a furniture shop in Maputo to sell her this project. I had already passed in my factory and in one of my lojas. He already knew me. I was the one who had to go. I had to go to the Pro Bilen and meet the Sr. Brahm Brewer in his house and see the projects he had. Fernandes shows me the signed contract. She says she paid Brahm 200,000 rand cash, but the development never went ahead and has since been abandoned. She says he promised to reimburse her the money, 
but she's still waiting. Chegou na minha loja, levou uma parte do valor, mais ou menos, deu parece que eram 50 e tal mil rands, isso convertindo em, em rands, mas levou em meticais. E depois veio uma segunda vez, também numa outra minha loja na Avenida Angola, também veio levar outro valor. Silver Pride to Golf Estate was another project. It was sold by Sean Brown from Golf Haven. More than 100 investors bought timeshare and property. But this project didn't even get off the ground. Sean Brown, Brown Brewer and attorney Nick De Beer allegedly can't invest us out of more than 15 million rand. Our attempts to get a hold of Nick De Beer were unsuccessful. Brown's net bank account shows he pocketed more than 5 million rand from this deal alone. I've got letters and correspondence where we said to Sean Brown, stop, you're making promises to people that is unrealistic. Meanwhile, the Hawks' investigation into the fraudulent activities of Brahm and his associates are ongoing. We are investigating fraud, and uh, our suspicion is that um, it was a scam because in Mozambique you're not allowed to, to sell land to people. The people that are implicated and breached themselves and that they um, falsified what their intentions were. And so the fact that the fraud was committed in South Africa in that the money was deposited in a trust account in South Africa, it, it gives us the power to investigate. I asked Brahm where the money went. This is when he stopped the interview. This is exactly why people said I shouldn't appear on your program because what you're doing now, leave it. This interview is over. You can put your camera off. Thank you very much. Thanks. I've tried my best. I think you, you're really uh, a, a not a nice person. It's exactly what I thought you were going to do. So what does President Armando Gobuza feel about the seizure of South African-owned properties? We'll get the answers after this. <laughs> President Armando Gabuza's visit to Shokwe in the Gaza province was a colorful affair. Hundreds of people came out to greet him. Gabuza was on a whistle-stop tour to assess progress and how to combat poverty in the province. Mozambique is one of the poorest countries in the world. It ranks fifth from the bottom of the UN's Human Development Index, behind the likes of Afghanistan, Ethiopia and Liberia. At a press conference, I asked the president on the importance of South African investments. He responded by saying I should direct this question to the governor of the province. President Gabuza said he didn't know about the closure of South African resorts, but said all investors are welcome as long as they comply with the country's land laws. I don't know what confidence is, I don't know what is, but I think that in any other country, there are norms. So, if they closed the South African Africans, they closed some of the American and others that can appear. Our country is a country in which the law should be respected. According to the Tourism Ministry, South Africans were the first to develop Mozambique's tourism sector. Investments last year amounted to about $300 million. So why is it that government is closing down property developments? The provincial director of tourism says the Gaza province is not fighting South African investors. Deixar bem claro que Gaza não está a combater o africano. Gaza combateu um comportamento estranho à lei e que todos aqueles que vierem para investir em Gaza é preciso saber que se requer do outro para fazer um complexo turístico tem que fazer complexo turístico e tem que vir com dinheiro para investir. Não quer tem que vir sem dinheiro. Requerer a terra, vender a terra para usar esse dinheiro para fazer investimento. Que isso via lá dentro. Meanwhile, the court battle for La Perla continues. This is Margarida da Silva and Gil Combali, the latest in a long line of legal advisers. Da Silva says it's seven years since the land rights were revoked, but there is still no resolve. We appealed on the decision from the administrative court, so it's still running. And also at the same time, we lodged some uh, court cases in the, the court of Sheishai. Ask, requesting the court to cancel the registration of the immovables into the name of the state of Mozambique. The land rights were revoked after it was argued in court that Pam Golding had sold land in South Africa. 
La Perla Limitada then launched five unsuccessful court cases to overturn the revocation process. Investors were assisted by Mars Legal, a law firm that also did consulting work for Pam Golding. I believe that he had a good advice, a professional advice from Mars Legal, Mars Legal and Pam Golding that was advertising that La Perla was selling land. So we have been involved in this process only after the revocation of the Duarte. In August last year, the authorities seized La Perla despite the pending court's decision on the suspension of the permit. The workers were evicted and investors' belongings were thrown out onto the street. This heavy-handed approach by the government left pensioners Ardi and Ivan van Veik reeling in shock. Destroyed us. You know, we, we were living like kings here. We were living in a, a life of absolute bliss. I mean, I don't think one in a million people lived like we lived in this beautiful country. Then in September, the public ministry applied to the court to have the property and buildings registered in the state's name. But the court rejected this application. Meanwhile, reports of looting at La Perla are ongoing. These pictures that were taken recently shows air conditioners and other removable items that were taken from the properties being transported in a minibus taxi. Last time when we had a meeting with the governor, there were some, some diligences to put some police there because people were vandalizing. So I don't know if they did that or not. Meanwhile, the governor of the Gaza province says nothing can be done until the court's final decision. When the cases are in the Supreme Court, uh, we can't touch it. We just wait for the judgment of the court. Therefore, all of us, government and the investor, uh, we are waiting for that. While investors wait anxiously for the final verdict on the doomed complex, time seems to be passing slowly. For homeowners like David Strong and his family, all they have left are fond memories of their holidays in Mozambique. And as for Bram Brewer, he appears to be repentant following the sad ordeal. Happened, and, and I'm sorry for people that lost money, but sometimes, in Mozambique, we all know that we took risks. I took risks. And, and I can blame the Mozambican government. I can blame attorneys. I can blame all sorts of things. At the end of the day, the fact of the matter is that we got burned. So who do you think is responsible for what happened in Mozambique? Give us your views on the story. If you're tweeting, use the hashtag special assignment, and you can also Facebook or email us. And at 2.30 p.m. on Friday, I'll be taking this discussion further. That's on my show on SAFM Radio. Now, I've picked out two comments from the many received about last week's show on the funding crisis in the NGO sector. Um, what Ludi Moreira wrote, Hardia is a mirror that reflects South Africa in its current form. Our values, our environment, our priorities, our future, if nothing drastic happens. While Rashid Raja emailed saying, I just watched the most saddest plight of Hardia Williams and the many other women in our country. Thank the almighty God for the many hardworking NGOs in South Africa who are doing great work in sheltering these women with minimal resources. Resources which should be provided by our government. Yet another shortcoming in our government. Well, that's it from me. Join us again next week when we point out the issues that matter.